Welcome to the Recovery Stories podcast, bringing you stories of hope, healing, and triumph over the bondage of addictions, mental health struggles, trauma, and dysfunctional family systems. Our courageous storytellers have chosen to live their journey out loud in order to show others that they don't have to suffer in silence. The stories you will hear are raw, real, and may involve graphic and triggering content. This podcast is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health's Rooted Alumni Community. If you or a loved one are struggling, have questions, or are ready to take the next step, call our admission center at 888-648-4098. Or visit us online at www.promisesbehavioralhealth.com. Our team is ready and waiting to answer the call for help. Welcome to this episode of Rooted Recovery Stories. My name is Patrick Custer, and I'm your host. I am so glad to be here today with a very special guest, somebody I'm really excited to talk to uh, today. Jamie Wyatt um, hey. is... Hey, welcome hey. to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me, Patrick. Absolutely. So, you know, there are so many ways to try and introduce who you are but I kind of feel like your interview is going to do all of that. I mean, we could talk about outlaw country, yeah. which I want to do. You're a singer songwriter. And I just, I love so many of the things about you, but one of the things that I wanted to mention at the very beginning, um, that is so that, that just draws me to your personality and wanting to know more and more about you is that, um, you have a unique sense of authenticity about you and, um, I truly believe that you feel as though you are someone from another time <laughs> um, yeah. and in a really cool okay. way, you know, like, <laughs> and so, and I want to get more into that. So, you know, having said that, we talk about outlaw country, that's kind of the yeah. genre that, that, that you're in. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, who isn't familiar, we have a bit, a broad audience on this show. And so I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of a description Um you know, a textbook description for outlaw country. And then I want to hear mm. about from you what it what is defined by you because you may be like, no, screw that. Um so yeah. 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 So, All right. So outlaw so, country, you want to know my take? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, in the 70s, the term was coined because Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings, country singers from the 70s, if you don't know who they are, definitely have a listen. But the, those folks um wanted to do music as in they wanted to record and release albums the way they wanted to do it they were tired of adhering to uh, a you know a big corporate entity like the record label and so they moved uh, um they started making their own albums and and releasing music the way they heard it and so that was considered outlaw but what is common in in that 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 is highly debated because by the way, outlaw country that this term is very highly debated. Okay, you go in the there's a lot of <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of Facebook fan pages that that um, all day they debate on outlaw. Uh -huh. country. What is it? You know, uh -huh. uh, but you know something that went along with that is that uh, Willie and Waylon did a lot of drugs and were you know perpetually trying to hide the drugs when the uh, police showed up or you know what I mean or their mm -hmm. tour bus was getting pulled over because because they knew they were you know drug users I I am in recovery right um but I do have a story that that it sounds you know sounds like more the cowboy version of outlaw where I I broke the law and I I did some time and and now I'm sober as a result but mm -hmm. so I was kind of looped into this um a country thing and and uh i did kind of study like the original outlaws like waylon and merle and willie and and just try to put my stamp on on country as a as a modern person in in you know modern times but uh mm -hmm. yeah so so outlaw is is called that for a lot of reasons um you could also call me music alternative country you could call it americana you could call it uh roots rock and roll there's a lot of ways to describe it but yeah outlaw's one of them and and i'm certainly happy to be a part of it uh yeah uh, to be a part of anything it, it, you know that is uh popular is nice but uh yeah it's a funny sure. thing it's a highly debated uh <laughs> topic well, well the 
the rebel in me loves that. I love the I love sure. that term. And when I was like researching, what does that mean? I, so I'm in Nashville. I'm a Nashville native. I've grown up here, yeah. and I didn't know. I mean, I've actually heard the term before, but I don't know okay. that I ever processed. You know, like that it was like an actual genre or something. I just thought it was some slang. You know, I I never really yeah. thought a lot about it. And so, um, as I was doing like my research and trying to learn more about you and 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 the, you know this whole thing. Um, it was really, it was fascinating to me because looking at, um, for those of you who don't know, we have this, uh, little space of town <laughs> on the edge of downtown called music row. So when she was referring to, you know, that the, the record companies that were dictating what these guys, what, what country right. had, you know, had to sound like that was, that was what it was. And they were rebelling against them. So I'm right. thinking to myself, I'm like, I I've grown up around like I'm, you know, friends with my, my friends growing up, their parents were like producers and that, you know, like we know, oh, well, we yeah. know the sound, you know, in Nashville, but I also, I also just love that. Like, you know, we in recovery are taught to embrace authenticity and finding and, you know, just defining who we are and embracing it in ourselves and in others. And I love that, um, you know, what I've heard you talk about so much, um, in, um, you know, your other podcasts and, you know, when you, when you're speaking publicly and in your music is just being authentic, going against, against the grain. Um, um, we need more of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. I think so. I'm, I'm so glad. I'm glad that, um, that you're intrigued by it. And, and I think that's definitely something I learned in recovery also is just that I certainly tried to, you know, please people in, in the past. I've, you know, I started out pretty young and I got my first deal when I was in high school in, in Los Angeles. And, you know, I certainly tried to just do what the record company wanted. And mm. then, um, you know, and it didn't really work out that well, or at least my music wasn't heard as much. Mm. And then only when I got sober and when I started really, you know, talking about things that were a little bit more taboo, like the fact that I am a felon or like the fact that I um, was an addict, you know, mm. and, and uh, you know, even saying I was more than just an alcoholic, you know what I mean? Like, but yeah. even saying you're an alcoholic, it, it it's still to some people is like, oh, are you, oh no, you're not that, honey. You know, uh, it, it's still a little yeah. bit taboo. Yeah. But yeah, so so I guess talking about things that are that are a little bit ta taboo is maybe mm -hmm. where the the outlaw spirit comes from as well. You know, it's being yeah. a little rough around the edges. Yeah, love it. Well, so talking about some of your music, I, I I've. I'm going to take a little bit of a weird structure with my questions, but um, sure. I wanted to dive right in with one song because it um, has gotten a lot of um, traction recently. Hurt So Bad featuring, uh, you featured Shooter Jennings on it, appeared yeah. on this season of Yellowstone. How yeah. cool was that? Very cool. Very cool. Um, I yeah. What a great show and, and what an amazing place to, you know, have people hear my music. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. I, I was really stoked and I'm very honored, in fact, that it's like, you know, there's a lot of great music out there. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the song, like why you wrote it? Um, and, oh. you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK. I dig what you're getting at here. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, God. Well, it's called Hurt So Bad. And I think that if you're in recovery, you may have had times in your life where you're able to, to mm -hmm. relate where it's kind of like, I know when I, so this, this song for me was written, I was, you know, I had relapsed. I had seven years sober and, you know, all after just, just trying to be, here's the thing is I was trying to be like good, you know, and that's yeah. what I equated being sober with was being good. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I came in at the age of 21. And then, so seven years later, it's like, I'm 28 and I'm married. I'm married to a man. And, you know, I, I'd always thought I was bi, but at some point I started to realize I, I, I really am not romantically attracted 
to men. And mm. so as you can imagine, that's a bit of a predicament being that I was married to a man. So yeah. I, um, you know, I'm, but it, it came to me because I was like seven years sober. I was like doing all the things, therapy, mm -hmm. um, exercise all the time, uh, working with others, um, you know, part of several communities, like so many therapeutic yeah. means. And I still felt different and empty. And um, I had the epiphany that I was gay. And I, I, um, I actually really struggled with that. I, I felt very guilty that I'd gotten married and stuff that I had you know, push my own instincts and, and mm -hmm. um, feelings so far down that I wasn't aware. I wasn't self-aware. Right. And yeah. so I felt an immense shame about that. And, and I did, and I relapsed around that, you know, I can't say exactly mm -hmm. sort of the perfect storm uh, precipitated relapsing, but sure. yeah. So I, um, I was, you know, lucky enough, and I say like, lucky, right, uh, that I, I made it back in to the rooms, and I was able to get clean and sober again. And uh, I was writing this album. And it was like, I don't know if anyone can relate. But I feel like when, whenever I am getting sober, I feel like everything kind of goes wrong for a while there, where mm -hmm. you're just like, Oh, my God, is this a test? Like, what is this to test, like, how bad I want it? Because, like, mm. you know, yeah, there's yeah. that feeling like, yeah, you you get sober and eventually things do work out. They do. Mm -hmm. they, they, they work. That's my experience. But at first, it's extremely challenging. And it feels like I'm waiting for, a, you know, a piano to fall on my head at, mm -hmm. at any moment because things are going that bad, right? And I just got yeah. bad luck. Um, so I was actually mourning um, my dad had passed away when I was getting loaded. So I didn't deal with that until I got sober. Wow. And like, I was, I didn't really deal with all the guilt and shame of, of coming out and getting a divorce. And mm -hmm. I didn't deal with it. I just got loaded. So like, you know, all those things were waiting for me when I got sober. Yeah. It was like, yeah. okay, you ready to deal with this now? And then, so, I mean, and it's, it's such a rudimentary unpoetic way to say how how i felt mm -hmm. you know but but um the best i could put it in the simplest most universal terms were that like you know why does it hurt so bad you know I, I, it feels like i lost the best i never had you know like i'm still on this journey and i'm in my 30s what mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what i mean i mm -hmm. thought you know storybook endings um weren't my story and and yeah. so that's what i have to write about they say write what you know and i have known a lot of misfortune but yeah. uh, i do think it's universal oh absolutely i and one of the reasons why i really wanted you to share that is because i feel like for those of us who are in recovery it's easy to see those words you wrote or hear them and identify and understand what you're getting at, you know, but for anybody who, yeah. anybody who isn't, you know, it, it, um, it helps to, to understand the, the backstory behind those of us <laughs> suffering, you know, it's not yeah. on the outside looking in, right. We look at what recovery should be and think it's right. this linear scale. Like you stop, you remove yeah. the substance, you know, and you get better and life starts to improve. But I love how you talked about, uh, that, you know, like, it sometimes fails our expectations. Like things do right. improve and they do get better, but it's not like this. It's like all over the place sometimes. And the timing is sure. not our own. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, and I think to like piggyback on that, Patrick, you know, I've read a lot of, about different things and what addiction does to the brain and stuff. Mm. Uh, but, but I do remember even just, as simple as being in, in the rooms of recovery and hearing someone else share, like, you know, to the newcomer, right. When I came in, like old timers are like, sit down, shut up, you know, listen <laughs> until you got something good to say until you got some recovery. But there's some truth in that too. Um, mm -hmm. Because usually when I'm talking, I'm not listening. Right. Um, yeah, and I had to love, yeah. learn, you know, the drugs and alcohol kind of change our brains and like, I'm only used to happiness being some sort of like blast of dopamine, right? 
and being yeah. some, you know, event that is just, it's, it's predictable. I know what to do when I use the drug or I take the drink, it's going to have a result that I know. And, and it's so like applying these things, you know, trying to live sober, then you're like kind of going along, like, well, this isn't how it normally feels. Right. It feels so yeah. different and weird. And, and, um, you know, there's without that instant gratification, life is really, it feels kind of numb for a while, you know, mm. and it feels, um, empty uh if even feels boring or it might feel depressing but only because i i'm learning every time i get sober i'm learning how to feel again and i'm learning how to be a human in society again you know yeah yeah oh so true and you know and i think the it's i love talking about this because yeah. it doesn't matter who you are the longer we're so the longer we stay sober and in recovery, um, the easier it is to forget exactly what you're talking about, you know, like yeah. the, the, what it feels like, um, acc acclimating, you know, coming out of the water and acclimating to, um, you know, feeling the <laughs> sober climate again. <laughs> yeah. So, um, right. That's yeah. such a good analogy coming out of the water. Literally, you're like exposed, you know, unmedicated yeah. mm -hmm. and exposed to the elements, mm -hmm. so, you know, emotional elements. Right. And, and yes. um, yeah, I've always leaned on, you know, I think a lot of people do too, right? Uh, uh, music is a really helpful tool mm -hmm. for when you're getting sober and you're like, I don't know what I'm. I don't know how to feel, you know, music yeah. is helpful in that way. Yeah. And it, and it helped me a lot. Um, not only getting sober, but as a young person or how to navigate my own feelings in my lifetime of, of whether that be disappointment or, or happiness. Right. Right. You're, uh, I think what you're getting at is the whole, like we use drugs and alcohol to either numb what we don't want to feel or ex right. or um expound expound on yeah. something that we really 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 like and yeah. music music can do both of those things if we, right? right like if you mm -hmm. if you just want to feel something you might not be feeling anything at all you start playing or listening and you know all of a sudden bam there it is or you're already yes. feeling a certain way and you start to listen or play and you know all of a sudden you, you know, what you couldn't find words for all of a sudden you're able to express. Yes. Like how, yes. What else does that? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I think it's a, uh, it's just one of the best tools. It's one of the best tools um, that I could find out there to, to help in the process, to help aid the process. Um, yeah. Especially being that like, I am, I consider myself as an addict. Uh, I, you know, maybe as a trait, quite sensitive mm -hmm. um, and avoidant. Mm -hmm. And so those two things <laughs> don't help each other. Right? right. Yeah. Right. So it's, um, you know, and then I even was like watching a film. I still watch a film like, you know, I'm always navigating the world as this person that like, you know, I'm, I, I still feel after being quite experienced on this earth that I'm unexperienced. I feel like, you know, well, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. Every day is different. How do I do this thing sober? Mm -hmm. You know, it really is one day at a time, but I watch a film and I'm like watching the characters um, and they're in college and they, they're drinking a lot. And I'm like, okay, so they, I actually in my brain was going, oh yeah. So they like, they're drunk cause they're happy. And then they, the, the protagonist breaks up with, the love interest and then he drinks because he's sad i'm like well shit are we all alcoholics is that how everyone i mean i just right. drink all damn day i, I didn't right. mean an event um but yeah i pretended to have an event right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyways, it's, such, yeah. it's such a good question i mean you know i've th that comes up you know Gosh, how many times do you have somebody ask that because they know that you're in recovery and they say, what is your opinion on 
<laughs> like, oh, yeah. Am what I constitutes alcoholic? exactly? Yeah, like, and I mean, you know, then you have that whole conversation. Well, there's definitely a million different flavors, and nobody can nobody can say that you are, but you. And oh, that's not the answer a lot of people want to hear. <laughs> Oh, I know, you know, right? Yeah. I was like, I always I have to reassure people a lot that I'm actually not monitoring their drinking. I right. when I was Same. talking about that film, I'm I was just thinking about how I feel about alcohol. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I his thing is that it's like it's all about how you're functioning in the world. My barometer right. is always like, you know, can I show up and do things? No, usually actually once I'm loaded, I can't function. I can't yeah. live with or without the the drugs. I need a little bit of extra help. I need a program. I need some therapy and mm -hmm. um, to get clarity on, on my life. I just, uh, you know, I end up in, uh, in jail. I end yeah. up um, depressed, right? Uh -huh. I end up not able to function at my best, not mm -hmm. able to operate at my full potential. And that's why I got sober. Um, and I, I had an album before this, this album is called Neon Cross. The one prior mm -hmm. is called Felony Blues because I am a felon and I got into recovery because I was, uh, I, I robbed a drug dealer and I, and I was arrested for that. And uh, I didn't know that'd be illegal, but it, it is, by the way. Well, okay. So let's talk about, get... <laughs> Let's talk about what what led to actually can we table that story because I want to get to sure. it. There's so much good there. I love that oh, story. Yeah. Great. Um and so um I want to go back just a little bit and talk about your early life and like go okay. to you know, go up through there, do a little bit of chronology. So um sure. you're from Washington State, right? That's right. I was I was raised up there. Okay, cool. And um family life, you wanna just tell us a little bit about like what what that looked like for you and um you know growing up in in washington was oh yeah i mean um it was actually a really great place to grow up and that it was um you know raining all the time and we grew up in the woods <laughs> on a little island called fox island um my parents had lived in la in the 80s and so they you know sort of like participated in a mass exodus from Los Angeles mm -hmm. to like, mm -hmm. you know, so my dad could get sober um, so they could raise us children in a, in a more tame environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so we moved to Washington where my parents had both their families were from. They're originally from Washington. So yeah, Fox Island, um, we had a house in the middle of the woods and, um, and it was great. I, I, was able to let my imagination run wild and play in the woods and, and also um, read a lot of books inside and, and play guitar. I started playing guitar when I was, I got my first guitar when I was five, but I started playing, you know, uh, writing songs before I could play guitar, Wow, <laughs> which is always interesting, <laughs> right? Yeah. Always a good sound. Uh, then, then playing guitar more seriously around uh, 11 and 12 and, writing songs as a teenager that was you know, uh, really good for me but but yeah I grew up in Washington uh, I don't even know what it's hard to remember what it was like oh well my parents divorced when I was eight um my dad mm -hmm. really you know maybe got sober for a minute but really never hung on to any sort of sobriety and so mm -hmm. he was always kind of like looking for the next next big thing and um so my parents got did divorced, you know but... did you know that he was uh not sober like did he hide it from you or did you see those consequences i didn't really see the consequences except for my parents fighting about it that's what i recall you know okay i just yeah. and 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 the consequences were usually that he had a new girlfriend i i remember that i just knew okay. that it was like he drank and he liked a variety of of women and so i just remember that you know but i didn't see i mean i've i've seen him sure in my adult years but um he wasn't like a, he was kind of a functioning alcohol and then yeah look and then he went to work and stuff which which i can't relate to i i can only you know function <laughs> for like a couple weeks 
Same. <laughs> you know, Same. I'm like, yeah, I can, I can relate. He was always waking up at like 5.30 a.m., but he was very busy. And so he wasn't around a lot. You know what yeah. I mean? Just okay. Busy. Yeah. So, and uh, so my mom was, you know, I, I identify as being raised by a single mother. I, I do. Mm. Even though I mm. had visitations with my dad, I don't really remember that so much. I remember, you know, yeah, like the, he had a house that had a pool table in the garage and I was into that, played pool for hours, yeah. you know, by myself. Um, and, um, and I had two older sisters and they were mm. very charismatic, outgoing. My whole family is very charismatic and outgoing. And I, I feel more like, um, I, I feel more like a person that spends a lot of time alone and journals and reads. What do you call mm. those people? Inclusive? <laughs> <An introvert>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you call them a recluse? Um, yeah. 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 There's a number of things I could think of. I'm like, I'm thinking <laughs> yeah. of. Our, our mutual friend, Amra, I'm, Amra uh, yeah. Towns, I'm like, she would, right now, she would be saying, all right, now this is the Enneagram number you are. I could, I can't tell oh. you what that is, but do you know what your Enneagram number is? I think I'm a four. Okay. I think that's the one that's the, like, you know, likes to journal <laughs> by themselves. Next. There you go. Oh, also like the identity crisis one. That's usually me. Okay. Uh, that fits yeah. really great with being a creative musician. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, totally. yeah. yeah. Um, my friend has a joke that everyone in Nashville is a four. Oh my gosh. Well, not everyone. I'm definitely a seven. Uh, which Are is you? The, What's oh, the seven? I'm, the helper? It's the enthusiast. So I'm like oh, super yeah. outgoing. Like what? We need people like you. Oh, yeah. thanks. Well, I'm glad to, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be needed. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. But, yeah, I mean, I think every every number is needed. It's cool to learn about those the personality traits and um, understand um, that uh, somebody it's somebody that uh, is so smart put together some things that really make sense to help us understand the things about our strengths and weaknesses. Um, that like that that whole thing I think is just is really cool. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. You, you know what? I, I had a therapist once tell me that um like she's like scientifically like humans are relational beings and i was like really like do we have to be but now <laughs> now i really really want to be i i yeah. understand we are social creatures and that we need each other yeah. we're you know we have different we all specialize in different things we need each other but um, yeah 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 you know so, i think it's always funny when i hear um Oh, just people talking on so, like social workers are usually the ones that I hear bring this analogy up. But, you know, how we hear all the time that connection is the opposite of uh, addiction or sickness, if you will. Oh, um, and that the, the greatest example of that is, you know, how how do we um, punish people in um, the, you know, that break the law, the, the most other than, you know, take take someone's life. It's solitary confinement. Right. Mm, you know, like yeah. that is the worst punishment that we can give someone. And no matter how much of a introvert you are, you know, you might be like, this is cool for three or five days, but you start to go crazy after, you yeah. know, like, yeah, you need it, some. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You need some so, connection. That's right. So true. Yeah. So, well, so. Speaking, of, speaking of connection, like, so in school, you, you know, it sounds like you were doing writing music and everything, and it sounded like, it, it, like a healthy outlet for you and whatnot, were you finding as you grew up and when you were in high school, continuing to pursue music? And I think you said you got signed to a label when you were a teenager, right? Uh, yeah, I was like a junior in high school. I was 17. And so. Wow. So did you, uh, did you feel connected then? And um, also was, was that, around the time when did you start dabbling in drinking and, and drugs yeah good good question um did you feel connected then and did you you like that's that's <laughs> yeah. the theme right are you connected or are you yeah. disconnected and yeah. that's um that's kind of been 
God, that should be the the daily question I ask myself, huh? Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> very wise, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know what? I didn't feel very connected because I, I actually always felt different since I was a young child. Mm -hmm. um, I showed up to kindergarten like wearing a full like cowboy rodeo outfit, you know, um, I love it. Wyatt is my middle name. Yep. And my parents were very into Americana culture and cowboys, right? So they named yeah. me Jamie Wyatt. And and uh Yeah, so I had this like cowboy thing. Like I thought I was gonna be a cowboy. I was it was my style, right? We had horses. Yeah. Um yeah. I so anyways, I went to school in kindergarten. Nobody was wearing that shit and I didn't know. Yeah. I was like, I'm wearing a cowboy. I'm wearing like a uh, cowboy hat, ginger snap shirt, like the one I'm wearing now, um, wow. cowboy boots, Wranglers, you know, um, sometimes the vest, oftentimes the vest, sometimes chaps, you know, I love it. nobody was wearing that. And I, I, I realized that it maybe made me kind of um, unapproachable. So mm. I didn't, <laughs> I was lonely in the kindergarten. And so I had to wow. dial back how I was dressing. But I felt um, different, you know, even when I did dress down like mm. the other kids. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think it's, I don't know if it's an added thing. I don't know if it's a gay thing, but I yeah. felt different. Um, well, and then when you have those two things line up with each other, when you right. already feel different on the inside and then the outside reflects that feeling that you're already feeling, it only, yeah. I mean, like, whoa, because then it just like validates what your those truths you're already starting to tell yourself, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, actually, um, yeah. And my parents were just like, you know, my mom was like, well, "You're just an artist." That's great, mom. That doesn't help me right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um. So I'm guessing that you embraced that and poured it into your music, but as like you got yes. into high school, did things change? Did you continue to feel different? And did you continue to, did you push others away or did you just feel like others were repelled and you just were isolated at, as a circumstance? No, I definitely, I definitely assimilated. Like I said, I definitely dressed down because I, I wanted to have friends. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to, you know, hang out with friends and stuff. And, but then, you know, at a young age, I, I got into smoking pot when I was like in seventh grade. And that was kind of like the ticket. I was like, oh, wow, I feel um, normal when mm. I smoke weed. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. feel normal. Like I knew very on that it was like good medicine for me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tried to I tried to smoke pot daily and I pretty much did I pretty much did through high school but I was a good student ironically you can do everything stone but but math and physics I found <laughs> um like for me you know I could sit down and write a paper like I, I and still to this day I'm not very um I'm okay basic arithmetic but mm. math is uh repulsive to me <laughs> <laughs> you know words are good words yeah. are cool um but yeah I well, so just I, stealing I, from I, stealing from your words earlier, we need people like you. So, <laughs> well, we need people who specialize. I think. I guess I just need to be. I definitely need a banker these days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We all serve a purpose, right? Yes. Oh, totally. goodness. So, yeah. Well, so, so got through. Got, got through. through. When did you know? When did it start? When did you, when did the consequences start for you? How did it ex, you know start excelling? Yeah. I think, um, you know, in high school, I started like, like drinking with like older kids. And mm -hmm. that was, you know, I don't think like young bodies can handle alcohol. So I do recall like passing out standing mm -hmm. one time, you know, so that's like, that or like getting sick, you know, my mom's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, mm -hmm. do you need to go to rehab already? She was like, okay. basically expected this, you know, being mm -hmm. that who she made children with, but, mm -hmm. you know, she was not an addict at all. Um, 
yeah, not an addict at all. And so, uh, you know, I, I managed to kind of like dial back the drinking, but having a hobby like music kind of helped me get by because that gave me a goal. Uh, you know, you don't get drunk before the show mm -hmm. so that you can get the show done. Um, there's rehearsals. Uh, so you're like doing something constructive while drinking. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, yep. I shaped my yep. life around drinking and drugs. I did. And, and luckily I, luckily or unluckily, I, I had something I could do while stoned. Um, but then, so I managed to have, you know, my sister's friend got me a record deal and that was cool. Went to LA, um, made an album. They put that album out. Uh, that album, you know, did, it was heard, people heard it. You know, this was the beginning of like having a website. Um, and so I just had a website. People would just email me there. You know, I didn't have management. I had a record deal, but I didn't have a team. So that gotcha. was, you know, I didn't know what to do. I was all alone. And wow. uh, the record business changed around that time. And it became like Napster uh, file sharing. Like, oh, my you know, gosh. Yeah. And so then then you couldn't sell albums to make money and, and pay the rent. You couldn't. It was the record business was like we don't know what to do with this, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we're not going to have artists anymore. And I was like, okay. Um, but that time, by that time, you know, you took away my means. You know, I yeah. all I did was get loaded then. So right. Well, not only your really means, but your hope. Like your, I, I have to think oh, that you'd be yes. like, where, I, you know, this is what I've I've attached my future to, you know, right. and now all of a sudden they're saying, well. There is we no don't do that anymore. We don't. Yeah, right. no, and you're like, not. what? <laughs> Good luck, uh, kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It was like, bye. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, taking away the hope, uh, that's when I went, you know, full force into mm. the addiction. And mm. and you know how addic addiction is. It's like, um, it just, it's progressive. So, yeah. of course, and, and I guess some people don't move on to different substances, uh, you know. Some people just find what they like and stick with it. Um, but it progresses even with the, I mean, no matter okay. what, it progresses, right? Like, oh, yeah, good point. Agree yeah, that it progresses point. the consequences. No, no matter what. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be open minded, but it, it is actually that way no matter what, unless you're not an addict. Then you, oh, right, right, you know. right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, right. I, me, I was trying to find that that perfect thing and i eventually found it with opiates it was you know i have that story where it's like i was taking pain pills and eventually i'm on heroin and that's mm -hmm. that's my story you know it just yeah. led one thing led to another heroin is much more che it's much cheaper than um vicodin yeah so it was yeah. a, an economical decision for me yeah. um, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I, I'm so grateful to that. Have you seen, um, oh gosh, what is the show that just came out on Hulu? Uh, Dope Sick. Dope Sick. I'm so that grateful great. for that show because. You finally explained it, it. Yeah. And it's one of those things that the people in our life uh, that we come across that don't know, you can be like, please take the time and go watch Dope Sick because you yes. will understand everything about the history, why it progresses the way it does and why opiates are so yeah. different than all the other, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's yeah. so intense and so good. Um, so good. But... So well done. I was really grateful for that film as well. And that, and, and if you haven't seen Dope Sick, that, that, uh, that's, it follows lots of different, well, addicts that come from all different kinds of backgrounds mm -hmm. and professions. Right. So not just yeah. the arty addicts like me, there was like, you know, uh, manual labor addicts there's a doctor addict the doctor yeah yeah even I mean, the doctor the good yeah. altruistic wholesome hometown doctor like yes yes you know yeah that's great does not uh, discriminate <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and in and, so, and yeah and they did a good job of following the progression of how it went from um mm -hmm. pain pills you know painkillers like vicodin to heroin yeah. Yeah. So you get to this place where you've gone from pain pills to um, shooting heroin. Shame plays. I always like to talk about shame because ain't nobody, oh, yeah. 
ain't nobody on this planet that doesn't have a story with shame involved, but especially right. those of us in, right, yes. And I love to talk Shame's about it. Shame's the number because, one offender though, I think. Yes, and I, I think that um, oh, if we haven't started to deal with our shame, mm. I, don't, I don't know, like that is like a huge building block of recovery. So yes. um, that's, that's one of the reasons why I love to talk about it because, uh, you know, where was your shame then? How early did it show up? Were you aware of it? And, you know, later, of course, I want to hear about how you dealt with it. But yeah, so yeah, at this point, yeah. you know, when you go from using pain pills, you kind of feel like, you know, like, oh, I'm just using drugs like everybody else recreationally. I'm 20 years old, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, eh. um, I'll stop when I want to. But when you get to heroin, right. what was your how what were you feeling about that did you have an awareness where you just like screw it all oh no i knew it was terrible i knew that uh i knew here's how i gauge shame it's like when i tell my mother no i was gonna hide it i was hiding and i was hiding it from everyone uh as well as i could so i mostly just didn't come around at that point because mm. it's very hard to hide that <laughs> that one makes you very yeah. sleepy um yeah so and skinny and malnourished and whatnot uh but yeah so shame i think i think even though when i started using daily when i knew i had to use something daily that's when i admitted shame that like i need mm. this and mm. i i actually wasn't in denial about that i i, I knew that i was self-medicating and that i was therefore deficient and needed medicine now yeah is it shameful to use heroin kind of it's more so for me like what do you got to do to get that heroin on a daily basis mm -hmm. right you have to steal mm -hmm. or i had to i had to sell my belongings i had to lie and steal and i i had a lot of stories about flat tires you know what i mean um yes yeah <laughs> right so <laughs> Um, um yeah yeah so i know I, that i mean that the stories abound you know i always talk about how you know it was crazy how i didn't know quite how creative i was until i got to the depths of my addiction and these stories would just like come out of my mouth oh, yeah. that i didn't even it was like there was somebody else like writing writing these stories for me that yeah. somehow <laughs> my my family and people believed uh or at least at the time they did um yeah so, elaborate stories yeah, yeah stories. right do you ever go back and think about some of those stories you told and think like wow how did a single person ever swallow that pill i was you know like <laughs> yeah i was you know i have some really funny funny i what i think is hilarious when i look back so i'm like ridiculous yeah how uh -huh. do people uh -huh. stand to be around me but i think most people are really i think most people are pretty nice like i was in a band with these really nice nice people their brother and sister and we all sang harmony and i was like in the depths of my addiction and, and i just got on to heroin but with heroin sometimes you get too tired so you gotta ha have an upper and i would have so i'd have some cocaine to stay awake or whatever mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um but I was at a rehearsal with them that, you know, I happened to show up to like one, you know, usually I just left them waiting for like hours and I was like, can't make it cars acting up again, you know, right. Mm -hmm. Whatever excuse yeah. it was that day. Yeah. Um, or <laughs> my guitar's in the, sh the shop, my guitar's <laughs> in the shop. Yeah. It's in the pawn shop, but it's right. yeah, some sort of shop. Anyways, yeah. I would just, I, I, one time though, I was like rehearsing with them after all these various stories I'd given why I couldn't show up all the time, right? Well, I just like leaned down to adjust my um, guitar pedal down on the ground and just like a bag of cocaine fell out of my, my um, it must've been a pocket like this on a ginger snap shirt. Uh -huh. And where just cocaine like landed flat on the ground, like right in front of the other, my bandmate. And I was just like, I proceeded to not say anything about it, start uh -huh. talking about the weather, grab it, put it back in my pocket and say, all right, so what song are we moving on to next? Uh -huh. I mean, that's very right. bold. I'm right. But it's what I had to do, you know? I was, yeah. 
Did they say at anything? that time? No. Yeah. No, it was, it's too uncomfortable for them. They, yeah. I think if they didn't have any experience with mm. alcoholics and drug addicts at that time. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the truth. Uh, uh, when people get uncomfortable, it's easier to ignore something staring them right, right. in the face. Um, that's why I think yeah. we have a lot of, my God, that's why my parents, you know, when I was telling them lies that really weren't that great, actually, they were elaborate, yeah. but they yeah. weren't great. You know, they, they eat it they eat it all right up because it's easier and more comfortable to believe the, you know, the, (laughs) what we're giving them than it is to actually confront the truth. Oh Uh, yeah. Cause the other thing is too, like maybe they'd already tried the confronting thing. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's like, you're not ready to change. You're not ready to change, but, but consequences do help getting, Like for me, consequences really helped me. Yeah. Same okay. here. So it's yeah. talking about consequences. Back yeah. to the story you were open enough earlier. You get to this place, you know, and I love that like we've kind of established you're at this place where you're using every day you need to just to yeah. feel normal. And right. it's not even to necessarily party, right? Like you're just trying not no. to go with it into withdrawal. Um, right. So... It explains so much why you'd be at a place where you would go (laughs) think like, okay, I'm just going to take, yeah. Yeah, this is funny. Um, God, I've told it a million different ways, but it, I just was, okay, so I had gotten a new dealer in Santa Monica. She, um, she wanted, she wanted crack cocaine. She was a user too. So most, Mm -hmm. most dealers are users. Um, or, or they're not, or they're just trying to like get ahead. But in my experience, I'd say a a majority of drug dealers are drug users. Um, Mm -hmm. and so this young lady was like a user as well. And she wanted to, she wanted me to find her crack cocaine. And I, I wasn't into that, but I was like, sure, no problem. Um, and so we were doing a trade thing and, and she got, really into that stuff and, and, uh, started to owe me money. And I was like, she's the dealer. I'm like kind of a small time dealer here. I peddle some pills and cocaine just Mm -hmm. to help my habit. Right. Um, she was technically a bigger like drug dealer than I was, but she started owing me money. And at some point I, I had also gotten into crack cocaine and so that heroin, but I, I credit I credit crack cocaine for these ideas I came up with. And those were that um, in order to get my money back, you know, I found somebody, some muscle, and, and we'd go knock on her door and get my money back. And it was mm-hmm. like 300 bucks, maybe two, $300. Um, but that's about a day's worth of, you know, a day or right. two of yeah. drugs. It's quite necessary. It's, you know, I needed that money. Yeah. So anyways, I had, I even had a show that night too, that I didn't show up to consequently, but my best idea, right. Was I'm going to go get that money because she's not answering the phone. Yeah. And so I, I did and took some money and some drugs and a laptop and, you know, I could have gone to prison for much longer, but, um, it was treated as a robbery. Um, but anyways, I, I what was the out. robbery? There was a specific type of robbery it was called, right? Like it was because you didn't have you didn't have a gun, right? Oh, like so, yeah, you, I didn't no have a gun. It was just muscles. Uh, it's called strong arm robbery. Actually, so I had you know, like that guy just like helped her back, and I was like, "Yeah, where's the drugs?" You know, and 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 that's terrifying enough. I'm not saying yeah. these aren't. I I took action that was aggressive, and that's still violent. You know. Um, that's terrifying for people. I don't care who you are. I understand why they prosecuted me. Yes. Mm-hmm. Dude, I think it was ironic, um, that I was, you know, that I experienced consequences for robbing, uh, another drug user and drug dealer. Right. Yeah. I thought that was, you know, odd, but I'm, I, I'm, I made out better than the other person. Yeah. Actually, the other person, um, died. She died from mm. heroin years later. Yeah. So I, I made it, you know, I got to live. And, yeah. uh, so that so consequence was... took you to jail though, right? 
Yeah, I didn't get arrested that night. Um, I was sort of like on the run for a few days. So I tried to go to rehab. And because I went to rehab just to to get away, it didn't mm -hmm. work. So I like walked out. Well, I walked out the door, you know, I was like the um, the cravings for heroin are so intense. It's that yeah. zombie withdrawal where it's like, you're not in your right mind, even when you're not on the drug. When mm -hmm. you're withdrawing, I really think that, you know, it's something for people to understand that um, I was withdrawing. I went right back to the streets and, and I got worse. That was actually, um, actually, I had not shot heroin up until that point where I walked out of my first rehab and I was on the street and I, I knew where to go. I was look for a park or whatever, look for yeah. somebody who looks as um desperate as i did right we find each other and and yes yeah, so i used uh heroin uh shot up heroin for the first few times and just kept overdosing but kept doing it again eventually i was i landed in the hospital in the er room for an overdose and i woke up in the er and i immediately say like can i use the phone and like can i go uh sort of panicking and the nurse said, well, you're not going anywhere. You burglarized someone. And I was like, I don't think that's mm. what it's called. But yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> and um, so then detectives came, picked me up from the ER and booked me. And uh, oh, but they're like, you know, you can go home if you tell us what happened. Right. And I had just gotten out of rehab. So I'm the idiot. Even my mom was like, don't don't talk to the cops. OK, but I'm like. No, no, I just got a rehab. They said that the truth was, will set me free. And so mm -hmm. I let these mm -hmm. cops. I I, I told the I incriminated myself to these cops. It was pitiful. I'm the worst criminal on the planet. <laughs> Not an outlaw, by the way. Here to tell you. They call us outlaw. I incriminated I myself. In the, yeah, I'm the interrogation. I love it. No, I no, granted, it. yeah, these cops were... A little bit dirty in there uh how they interrogated me yeah. i i don't appreciate that in retrospect but again i i got clean in the process yeah so you went to jail and that was was that the was that what got you really got you clean the first time yeah it got me to thinking about being clean i'll tell you that and it's there's not there's not no drugs. I love this thing. There's not no drugs in jail. Um, there uh, yeah. are drugs in jail. So they were around and I was desperately like trying to stay clean, but they were kind of around. And so I did use a little bit, but then eventually when I was going to be released, they said, you know, I'd be on, I did eight months county time, eight months incarcerated, and then three mm -hmm. years probation. Um, but upon my release, I, I was released to a residential treatment program for six months. And I thought to myself, well, if I get loaded, well, no, they told me also, if I were to get loaded and test dirty with the probation office, I'd be sent to prison. So mm. I, I had to think about that. Like I thought about yeah. the life I was sort of having in, in jail at the time. And I was like, oh, it's not so bad. I guess I could get a guitar and write some songs while I'm in here. In prison, you can have a guitar. But really? We, yeah yeah and and as you should honestly i think that yeah. um i don't think that incarceration should be a an additional there's you shouldn't be punished additionally while incarcerated because i think it's enough to take away your freedom trust yeah, me people feel it they yeah. feel it um yeah. and it really only you know makes the trauma worse uh mm -hmm. but i had what I didn't like about jail in particular was the politics in there and the culture mm -hmm. that developed because, it, you know, because of poverty and class systems in, in this yeah. country. Yeah. But that I, I couldn't deal with the politics so well, which just really wasn't gangster after all. And so I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to really try and get sober because I, I don't want to live in the politics of, of this like mm -hmm. street life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I do like, so, yeah, I do like, did you do it? Did you get sober at the tail end of being in jail or did it, was that yes. something that you did? Like once you got, okay. Yeah. So I got it at the tail end there and then I went into a program and gave it my all 
uh, yeah. to, to change and to have a foundation in recovery. And that, right. that lasted, as I said, that lasted seven years I was clean after I stepped out of jail. So that that's was, awesome. That was my well, first introduction. And, you know, not that I say, I'm not saying that I love that you relapsed, but I love that we have, mm. uh, that we get to talk. I want I love that, that, that we get to dive into that part of your story. I mean, like, I don't love yeah. that anything bad ever happens to anybody, but oh, I'm yeah. a believer that relapse is part of, it happens. It's part of, you know, we, yeah. we have addiction, addiction is a disease and relapse occurs with everything from diabetes, cancer, you name it. Right. Yeah. And, um, so I think that when we talk about recovery in general, relapse is just as important of a thing to talk about. Um, yeah, because it's so real. And, um, that is one thing that I think, you know, we have so much that we talk about in, um, breaking the stigma right now against mental health and addiction, yeah. but it's foundationally, right? It's just those things in and of like John or Sally have these problems. They should be able to have them and not be, you know, there shouldn't be a stigma there, but there's that second layer with addiction that I think the general public still doesn't understand and that we, we can do more in advocacy and raising awareness that just having grace for someone because they are, um, you know, they're an, uh, I hate to put a label on it, but right. Somebody who struggles with addictive, um, behaviors, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that, you know, like we have grace initially and then it's like, well, if you don't exert your self control, you know, that, that, the relapses occur, they're real and um, doesn't make anybody less good or less strong right. or, you know, um, because they, because they happen. Um, but, you know, you had a lot happen in your life in that seven years, right? Like, so, yeah. you know, we haven't really dove into yet your, the, the queerness, right? Like, so right. you. Yeah. yeah. I still have barely dove into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know but like I was almost 30 when I came out to my family you know wow. that's um talk about shame I was you know I dated women when I was um 18 to 20 um and then when I got sober I thought that's something I did when I got loaded and I even had mm. like you know people in the program older sponsors tell me that's something they did when they got loaded and so I was like okay so I don't do that. Right. Okay. Right. That's just, then it became a shameful thing that I, that I'm gay. Like, right. So like a, that, so it wasn't part of me getting sober to be queer, to be myself. It was, you know, be good, pretend I'm straight or, and, you know, assume and assimilate. Right. And assimilate this normal, normal quote unquote lifestyle lifestyle. Like right. Voice. Well, and it sounds like so many, like so many of us, you associated and that I'm saying us myself, because mm -hmm. I'm a gay man and like growing up, right. I associated that like my goodness as a person and my salvation and spiritually and what have right. you with, <laughs> right. With, with, uh, you know, following the path of righteousness, uh, if you will. And, right. you know, be, being romantically involved with female. So um, w with your history, your upbringing and everything, what was, how had homosexuality been presented to you insofar as being right or wrong? Was it overt or were these mm. things that you absorbed? You know what I mean? Like how was your worldview on homosexuality communicated to you and what was it? Yeah, that's a good question. I uh, it you know, there was definitely I definitely had family members that were that made homophobic homophobic comments about mm -hmm. especially about gay women, oddly enough. My mom loved gay men. Um you know, she was in fashion and that's like of course, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and that's great. Yeah. Um I was certainly happy to hear that, but I I did find it, um, I just made note to, not to be a gay woman. I just mm -hmm. made note. And then growing up, it was a small town where I went to high school and there was a lot of youth groups. So a lot of um, 
And I went to youth groups so that I could like go on the snowboarding trips and hang out with people. But I, I wasn't mm -hmm. raised religious. Um, however, I did take cues from so many young, my friends being religious. I did mm -hmm. take cues that it was just like, you know, and these kids would be good Christian kids, but they'd make, make fun of gay people, right? I got yeah. more homophobia. Yeah. And in a small town where you could really get bullied for a lot of years and not have anywhere to run to. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was definitely flying under the radar um, as in not embracing any of my true feelings for yeah. a lot of years. But yeah, so a lot of, uh, definitely a lot of homophobia around, but no, I'm grateful I wasn't ridiculed personally. Um, but I think that I, I did everything I could to avoid that. Hmm. Makes yeah. sense. We like surviving, mm -hmm. right? Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you make this, you know, conscious slash subconscious effort to um, be good once you got sober and yeah. um, find this guy and you end up oh, getting yeah. married, right? Yeah. My, my ex-husband is a really good friend of mine. And he, and I'm grateful he's a really good friend to this day. Um, we met in recovery and yeah, I, you know, people in recovery are pretty cool. And yeah. He's one of them. So we met in recovery and I was working in treatment at the time. And so was he. And um, turns out we were just best friends the whole time. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm sure he, he was definitely hurt when I left him, but. I, like I said, we're able to be friends today and, and support each other. And, That's uh, awesome. but yeah, he was a really cool guy. I think, you know, some, in some way, shape or form, we were rescuing, rescuing each other, I guess. Mm. Right. Um, yeah. you know, in recovery, yeah. like it's hard to be alone. I think some, some, it is right. Yes. Be alone. Absolutely. Um, it can be hard to be alone. It can be hard to be with others um, yeah. and be intimate. But um, yeah. Well, so especially I, when I think the hardest, hear me out for just a second. Sure, In yeah. my, I, I just had this thought, right? Okay. I think the hardest time of you, like you have, the, we have the hardest time both being alone and being with other people when we haven't mm -hmm. reconciled who we are, what we like, what we desire, like all of yeah. those core things about ourselves. Like if we yeah. haven't recognized, acknowledged, and embraced those, then we we can't connect truly and authentically with those around us. Yeah, and we're obviously not connecting with ourselves. So we can't like that's where it leaves us is it's an isolation no matter if we're by ourselves or with the person that we're supposed to be connect you know or yeah. in a room full of people or your husband you know right yeah yeah it makes so much sense mm -hmm. yeah and I, and I spent a lifetime avoiding my true self so I really only knew how to avoid others as well yeah, mm. so I think I think you're right, and the intimacy begins with a relationship with yourself, and and that that's how it's begun finally now after all these years um, mm. for me. But yeah, I so I divorced my husband, and I um, and I started drinking and 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 using. Um, I I haven't used heroin since I was 21, but I tried everything else, hoping that I could just use everything else and not have mm -hmm. not end up in jail again or not ruin my life i i turns out i'm not successful at using anything mm -hmm. um and keeping and and maintaining some sort of like life and success and happiness i'm not yeah. I, I don't do the two together so yeah yeah alcohol was it consequences that brought you to recovery this time or was it oh yeah uh, yeah yeah, okay. more so, um, pardon me, I'm like wiggling around here. You're good. It was more so that I, yeah, I just lost my mind and I lost everything. Uh, friends, again, I was, again, mm. I was isolated with and by my disease. So I, you know, mm -hmm. 
ended up on the street again um, in Hollywood. And I, as a result, was finally like, you know, burned bad enough by drugs and alcohol that I could, um, that I was done. Yeah, and it, and it took a lot to be done. It took a lot of trying to be done. I thought for sure when I, you know, made the decision to drink again, I was like, I'll come back when I'm done. I'll come back right. to the rooms of, of AA and NA when I'm done. But what I didn't count on is that I wouldn't be able to do that when I wanted, you know, mm -hmm. and that I, I would... I'd have to wait till the disease was done with me. And that's exactly yeah. how it happened. You know? Yeah. 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 So, um, is that, did that precede, um, the, what was the, the, um, oh, did it precede or... neon cross that my yes. album or Yes. Yeah. So I put on my first, I made felony blues while I was sober and while I was time. married. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And that was all about kind of, you know, getting sober and, and and kind of digesting the whole jail and um, being in the system. Like Felony Blues mm -hmm. was describing that whole experience and the shame around being incarcerated and being an, an addict and whatnot. Now this, <laughs> when I, I got loaded in the middle of supporting felony blues and um so then i got sober and made a whole nother record called neon cross uh some songs actually on neon cross were written intoxicated um but there was a lot a lot of different kinds of grief on neon cross like mm -hmm. I, my dad died suddenly and um i had you know being in recovery i don't know about you patrick but i've since being in recovery, I've had a lot of friends die from overdoses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I experienced a couple of those. Um, and all all those, all that, you know, grief and loss, and then coming into my own queerness, that's all, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the many themes on Neon Cross, that grief yeah. and loss and being queer. Well, so, <laughs> all things yeah, so you came out was that that album was you coming out publicly right publicly yes uh-huh yeah. um and so i mean there's so much so many questions i have because a i think that's so cool when you're finally ready and you're a musician and yeah. you're like you know what i'm gonna like i'm gonna do this in a big way i love doing things yeah. in a big way personally so right. uh, yeah. yeah why not do it and why not make it part of your album make but, it an announcement <laughs> yes Hello, yeah, make a thing out of it it's worth yeah. celebrating absolutely i think so and that's that's really what i wanted to celebrate with people yeah and since then i've gotten it you know i wanted to keep it to myself for a long time and i didn't want to come out because i had started to make a name for myself in country mm -hmm. music and i had a lot of straight male fans and mm -hmm. wanted to you know i'm like is everyone just going to abandon me and um, I found that it was more important that I show up for somebody who might be struggling mm -hmm. with their own queerness. Um, because I was like looking back, I'm like, okay, what's really important? Recovery yeah. has taught me that it's, you know, it's not just about economic survival. It's not just about, you know, keeping a distance, but I've done mm -hmm. best when I have been more vulnerable i've reached more people when i've been more vulnerable when i've shared things about myself that are not perfect and graceful so i mm -hmm. i you know uh i went the route of coming out with this album and and since then i've gotten you know a lot of great responses that from people that were struggling or that just feel seen when they know that i'm queer and i'm writing about being queer and and I'm singing country music. They, you know, a lot of people like that and feel safe now in the mm. country music space. So, you know, not just because of me. A lot of people came out before me too. But yeah, uh, but you know. I love that. I think that being a, uh, I think about the little 
little Patrick that grew up in Brentwood, yeah. Tennessee, as I roll my eyes. Um, uh, I was so sheltered. I was homeschooled my whole life. You know, oh, I was yeah. very sheltered. Right. And I wasn't exposed yeah. to really hardly any gay people until right. I was like older than most kids are. Like I was definitely okay. a teenager. And, um, and even then when I was exposed, you know, it was very controlled and, and I, I'm saying all this to say I didn't have uh, role models. I didn't have exposure. I just saw, I just knew about people who were gay that were overtly gay that my, either my yes. parents or family would point out, you know, in, in this or that way. And so um, one of the things that I'm just loving about that's happening in, in culture right now. Um, yes. And I heard you joke about on another <laughs> on another uh, podcast, and I love this so much when people ask yeah. you about and say like, "Well, so is this your was this your agenda all along, like wanting to be outlaw, like coming out, you know, yada yada yada." <laughs> um, and I love the way if you just share that, like the whole thing, your whole thing about whether or not it's an agenda and whether or not an agenda is <laughs> like even a bad thing, right? Like, so just, oh, but. I yeah. think I think I know what you're talking about when I was like, yeah, I mean, I have been so, you know, um, people on the Internet have been like, oh, here's that gay agenda again. Yeah. And and my gut response and what I've written a few times, but what I like to say in interviews, it's like, yeah, it is a fucking agenda. The agenda mm -hmm. is like, how about these kids not have to do what I had had to do, which was use drugs feel alienated, nearly lose my life several times because I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel that I was okay for being queer. Like if that's yeah. the agenda, like save some kid's life who's struggling. So if me coming out helps some young kid feel okay and not want to commit suicide or take drugs, yeah, that's the fucking agenda. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I'll proudly claim that agenda, the gay agenda. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. How come? Yeah. What? Well, how come other like people for existing don't get um, an agenda? I don't right. know. I'm still right. trying to figure that one out. How too. did they get the agenda? Yeah, I don't know yeah. who coined that one. Some clever politician did that. Right. I think so too. And all it does <laughs> is divide us. Um, I know. But you know, I you know. Another thing that, you know, I've heard you talk about is, you know, that mental, when it comes to mental health, when people are happier, right? Like we yes. do better as a society. And yeah. so um, that's one thing that I think about when I was talking about like the little me, like mm -hmm. I think about how, and I mean, my gosh, the little version of you growing up feeling isolated and not knowing, being able to embrace your identity, yeah. feeling different. Yeah. You know, right? Like if you had had some something to relate to or, you know, a person or something that made it made you feel gave you some hope that there was something yeah. to, you know, look forward to and be happy and healthy and, you know, different mm -hmm. pictures other than what, you know, the mom and dad were raised with, um, you know, yeah. that hope, I think, is where what we're talking about, like it provides yes. that bridge for young people. Absolutely. Absolutely. To see a version of, you know, themselves grown up. Um, mm. I was looking for that. And I'm sure there were certainly gay women in music. Um, I didn't see them. Uh, I didn't see too many of them like wearing cowboy boots or, or, or appearing kind of feminine. That's the other thing is like, I'm kind of a femme appearing or femme presenting gay woman so like you know i grew up in this time you know uh 2000s and the nine and well i was pretty young in the 90s but that it was like gay women had to be like butch or they weren't gay yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what i mean it was like okay so there was that whole thing um but yeah i i'm here so that and i'm here saying telling people that i'm queer so that a young person can feel okay and go on with their life and, and um, do whatever they want to do yeah. and not have to make themselves smaller. I love that so much. Yeah. Um, so 
you know, I, I've heard you say that you're a late bloomer, you know, and yeah. referring to, you know, coming out later and, you know, um, what's, what's changed for you since that time in your adulthood, you know, um, what have you been able to identify that's, that's changed in relationships or life in general, uh, since coming out? Yeah, I'm a little more comfortable in my skin. Um, a little bit funnier, a little bit, um, just funner to talk yeah. to even. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm a little more, a little bit more comfortable. I have my days, you know, and this, this recovery things one day at a time, but for the most part, like I'm, I'm kind of okay with however it turns out life. Right. Yeah. Um, I've also met someone, I, I have a wonderful partner and I've, I've been blessed with the experience of love and that was, that's cool. Cause like I'm 36 years old now. Right. Like that's mm -hmm. my first love right there. And that's crazy, but whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to judge myself for it. Cause no. you know, I've, I've been able to make art in the process. I've, um, I have wonderful friends and family, but, um, what else? My mom is basically waving a rainbow flag on a daily basis. And that's, that's cool. pretty cool. She never, she, would, she never was not, but she like, honestly was just in denial because here's the thing. Like I was, I played little league. I never, I didn't mention this. I played little league with all boys and I skateboarded like that softball is the dead giveaway for the right. stereotype of gay women. Right. Uh-huh. Yep. I played softball, Patrick. She didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I mean, it's one of those yeah. back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, like it, it this was an addiction, but like when it if it if it feels uncomfortable, it's just mm -hmm. I feel like it's it's just human nature for us to be like, I don't see it. It's not real, yeah, it's you not know. Fair. <laughs> I can't yeah. see you, you're not there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, hell, that's, I mean, we do that with ourselves for so long. So for there's so long. almost this, this period of like, when it comes to for our parents, I mean, like they, and our family members, like they, especially from that generation, like they have mm -hmm. to go through their own process, kind of like ours of yes. acknowledging it's a thing saying, okay, that's okay that it's a thing. Uh, how do I feel about, you know, like going through the whole process, like all the, the same thing we did. And it's so easy. I know for myself to go to a place yeah. of like, well, once I'm okay with it, you should, when I present you with this information, you should immediately be kind and accepting and encouraging and supportive. And while I hope that we get to this place where that is the case with everyone, um, you know, we can't expect grace if we don't give grace for people's timing on some things, I think. Yes, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that God, if anything to remember today, too, is like, if I give myself grace, which I'm allowed to, and I'm, I'm, yes. I'm allowed to, you know, I should, should give myself permission to have grace and give others grace. Uh, kind of no matter what. I mean, I guess... Unless, yeah. you know, it's just, it's hard to be human and make mistakes. It's hard yeah. to look at those mistakes for anyone, you know, whether they're mm -hmm. mine or someone else's. Mm -hmm. uh, so true. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. So I've got a couple, uh, I know we're, we're running close on time here, but I've got a couple right. last questions that I wanted to ask you about. So, um, uh, yeah. So, oh, being gay and being in country music and not just uh -huh. country music, like a subsect, you know, the outlaw, uh, outlaw country. Um, <laughs> and then also being a female, right? Like there's a lot oh, of yeah. things there that, um, I, yeah, I mean, I'll go ahead and say it. I know it's a thing that like females get less, less uh, airtime and air pl yeah. and play on the radio and country music. Uh, right. I mean, it's not equal. There's like equality. We are far from equality when it comes to country music right now. Right. Or, yeah. You know, when, for that. So I'm curious, how do, what's your experience today? Um, 
living in Nashville, uh, especially, okay, so you're living in the town that Outlaw Country said, screw Music Row, but now you're yeah. in Nashville, right? Like, mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of like contradictions going on, which I love. I love living in a world yes. of contradictions. Um, yes. I just wondered if you'd speak to the climate, you know, right now and what you see and what you're experiencing. Are, do you feel ostracized yeah. now? Have you felt ostracized? Uh, probably not. I mean, I don't know. I think sometimes, yes, but I try not to give much attention to the negativity if there is any mm. or if I'm being ignored. Um, really, it's a practice, but I, I do practice giving my attention to where the love is. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. I can't control much else. I think that queer people in country are making themselves known. And mm -hmm. I'm grateful for that. I'm not the only one. And things are changing in this. I mean, millennials are like, you know, young people now are like, I'm non-binary and I'm 11, you know, and thank God, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. I don't, don't struggle. Um, I hope that young people don't struggle as much as I did, right? Like, yeah. or with the confusion and the discovery part. But mm -hmm. um, that's also making an impact here in Nashville and here in country music. And mm -hmm. I just think it's a matter of time. Hard to tell, uh, like lately with pandemic is like sort of such a, it was such like a reorganization of things that were on their way out, you know, trends. And um, mm -hmm. so I think honestly, the last year was also productive being that it was all on the internet. And yeah. then people had to read a lot of things that they wouldn't otherwise pay attention to because there was nothing mm -hmm. else to do, but read things online about society that, had to change so i think last year was very progressive and um a lot of good things happened so there's also a lot of movements right and i'll wrap this up but a lot mm -hmm. of movements right now advocating for marginalized people in country music um i can't say that'll make it to actual music row but there are so many as you said sub sections of country mm -hmm. music now that are just kind of like doing the work around um the work around the more traditional um, gatekeepers, you know, to just avoiding that whole route. Like if, they, if there's gatekeepers on Music Row, which there are because they're preserving their own belief. We all just follow mm -hmm. our own beliefs of what we think country sure. is or what we think it should be. So anyways, if they've got they're operating their, you know, gate gatekeeping, then uh, other people are just using the Internet and going around that and making fans so which how cool is that that it's you know, great right just, yeah, yeah 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 i think that it's given um it's bringing equity to um uh, everything in in many yes. ways that that yes. wasn't possible before um yeah. so yeah very I mean, cool However marginalized I think I am, there's somebody else that is that is more marginalized than me, for sure. So, I mean, you know, um, yes, we still, I think, as a woman, I'm trying to champion other women. I mm -hmm. think that's the solution, right? Yep. And, um, you know, be supportive and, and um, you know, elevate black artists as well mm -hmm. right we've been talking about yeah. that for last year that's important and yeah. um and yeah creating space um i think acting as if there's enough room for everybody is the way to do it um mm. that that's where i'm trying to come from you know that's what i'm trying Absolutely. to show and through my actions Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, okay. Two questions left. Uh, is there a, um, is there something special from your life that you are willing to share with us that you want to write about that you haven't released a song about yet, but you want to? 
oh, am I working on new material that has us, yes. you know, maybe breach the new subject? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. Do I have love songs? I don't know. I got, yeah, some, I have a lot of unrequited love songs, right, on Neon mm -hmm. Cross, whereas mm -hmm. I think now I'm writing more love songs that are in the moment and appreciative of love mm. and um, and are appreciative of, of another person, of, yeah. like, from my partner and my experiencing love. So I'm excited to bring those songs to the world because I think we all kind of as well as the searching songs um songs that help others be in the moment like mm. help me be in the moment are really necessary yes. too like i listened to entirely too much al green for the last couple of years so <laughs> there's you get i hope some of that influence comes in uh yeah we'll I, I i love that anything and everything that we could do to encourage us to get in the moment where our feet are yes. that's what i'm trying to do today for sure yeah so yeah, um good. yes so um i just did i wanted to highlight too that you know thanks to where we where we've gotten with the fingers crossed everything with the pandemic and everything you're you're touring yeah. again this year 2022 um right. and as we were talking about before more to come but that that's all on your website we'll have it in the show notes as well right yeah you know what that's the main thing i guess is if you're listening to this that you know how to spell my name it's jamie <laughs> wyatt you know but it's it's spelled like jaime so j-a-i-m-e and then wyatt like wyatt Earp, w y a t t j a i m e w y a t t and it's just jamiewyatt.com or at Jamie Wyatt for Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of a main platform. Facebook as well, but um, more often on Instagram. Awesome. Yeah, Very so that's awesome. what all all the dates are. Uh, there's some. There's U.S. dates, um, California, Texas, uh, and Oregon, just to name a few. Norway. Uh, I, I can't pronounce the city. It's near Oslo, I think. Yes, and it's a festival and on August 6th in Norway. But there'll be tons of dates posted and updates as well. As we come out of this slow season, we'll start mm -hmm. making more announcements. Love it. I um, am excited to see, I'm excited to hear whenever you, I love already the music that you've already put out, but I'm excited Thanks. to watch your journey grow and your when the new music comes, what it's about, yeah. and just, you know, embrace that. So, oh, cool. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for, um, th thanks for asking me questions and being interested in, in me and, and my music, Patrick. It's really cool to um, share so many important things in common, by the way, like to be yeah. clear, to be in recovery and um, to be here in Nashville and, yeah, it's it's really wonderful to connect with you. But thank you for honoring my music and, and asking me to be on your show. You got it. Absolutely. Okay, last thing. What's your what's your favorite <laughs> coping what's your favorite coping um coping strategy tools that uh help you stay in the middle path of healing and wholeness today? Mm. Positive self talk, conscious mm conscious and the main maintenance of positive self talk um self-awareness around what messages i send myself on a daily basis but so that would include self uh, positive self-talk would include um affirmations i think i've seen some really incredible results with uh affirmations you know i'm talking about in the mirror looking in your own eyes and like saying i love you and saying your name or saying i forgive you all those things so incredible mm, i love that and i embrace that as well and i think it's one of those right. things we've all heard but you're the first person when i've asked that question to say that on this podcast so i'm oh, so good. glad you shared that yes i think it's me too important. i feel yeah. special now too <laughs> awesome. you are special so well yeah you too. Thank you, Jamie Wyatt. It's been such an honor and pleasure to have you on. And uh, 
Yeah. Thanks again. And to everybody listening, it's been a great episode. Thanks for sticking around. And please make sure if you haven't yet, check out everything Jamie Wyatt, because she has got some awesome music that that uh, is just waiting for you to uh, check out. So go and do it. And with that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We are out. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Goodbye. For more information on today's episode, check out the show notes. Recovery Stories is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health's Rooted Alumni Community. If you or a loved one are struggling, have questions, or ready to take the next step, call our admission center at 888-648-4098. Or visit us online at www.promisesbehavioralhealth.com. Our team is ready and waiting to answer the call for help. Whether you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please share with your friends. Follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. We are grateful for you and hope that you have been encouraged by today's episode. As always, remember you are only one decision away from a completely different life, and it is never too late to start loving yourself. 